Um, a real pleasure now to introduce um, a gentleman who's worked with Chris Rowland quite a bit in the past. Um, he's a master printmaker at the print room in Cambridge. Studio. Print studio. Sorry, Kip. His name is Kip Gresham. And uh, Kip, come on up. Thank you. Uh, please tell me if you can't hear. I like that. Uh -huh. Good. Um, right. I'll start by telling you a couple of things about myself before we st get going. Um, in the hall in my house, there's a big oak cabinet which has a wood grain that runs from one end to the other. And on one end of it is a sculpture which has a white line running through the stone. And the line through your, through your eye goes down through the wood grain. And down the other end, there's a little wooden train that sits on the wood grain, as if on rails. But in the middle is a stone about that big, which has a, a line through it. And the line sits on the wood grain. And in conversation with my grandson, we have an understanding that if you turn the stone, the great universe stone, everything stops. All the bad things in your life that are going on come to an end. He knows at the age of 10, going on 11, that this is real in one way, but not real in another way. It's a metaphor, but it's the thing he carries around with him in his head as a means of transformation. He can turn it on, turn it off. That's my attitude to image and meaning that it is what you see, and it can be something else as well. But it's your head and your eyes in tandem that do that. The, the next thing is that um, I'm a two-dimensional man. Um, I don't really do sculpture. Um, I think in terms of uh, flat image. Sculpture is too confusing for me. Um, I like the nature of visual language. And as you'll gather with the bit about the stone, um, the smaller the statement, the better. Anyway, my wife is a calligrapher, and a good one, and much better at calligraphy than I am at drawing. But anyway, together, we made um, the seven seals. This bit from Revelations is very important for me. The lamb, the Christ, is injured, all-powerful, dead, all-powerful, simultaneously. Also, the throwing of the switch, the understanding of what's really going on behind everything happens through <coughs> this injury, de death. Also, it's got the idea of the seals. I like the idea of stamped on my heart, stamped on my brain. So, as you'll see from the title sheet uh, down one side, there are a series of, um, they're actually pictograms. Uh, they're drawn from various traditions um, but they related, and, I, and I'm, forgive me, I can't remember now, it doesn't matter whether you know what they are or not, but at one point, for somebody, somewhere, they meant things like uh, wheat, power, and so on, war. Uh, if I get the right arrow here, which I think might be that one. Okay, we begin. Um, each of the sheets has two, well, most of them, there's one that doesn't, has two elements, one of which is a pictogram, uh, and on the other side is, there a, is a vague reference to uh, an element from the text below. Then they're accompaniments to the text, they're not illustrations. Um, there's an arrow running through, there's a horse come lamb come whatever there, and so on. And the parallel lines that are running through there are one of the elements that 
go all the way through. Um, in early pictograms, two parallel lines, certainly, but sometimes three parallel lines, uh, meant um, union or friendship. Okay, the sword and the cross are the same thing. You, I, I'm now in an area where I can't really speak about it. The whole point about this is that the imagery is itself. It's not an equivalent for, it's not an apolo apology for anything. It's not a, um, it doesn't pretend to be something else. It is itself. And in reading the text, uh, I didn't think I'm going to do a picture of this. What I thought was, how does this feel? How can I pin down what I'm thinking? It's, em it's emotional rather than intellectual. And the nature of drawing is that, is that way anyway, in that you start and you go on and it gets better, it gets worse. Um, and in a sense you have to let it have its, its flow. Okay, now this one is fairly literal in one way, you know, in terms of the, the scales and so on. At this point, I should talk a little bit about the colouring, because um, sitting in the room here is, is a man who owns one of the earlier sets um, and has just talked about Blake and how um, you know, the, his work and on the way up, we were talking about the variability of the colouring. I'm a printmaker, so the background on this, the, uh, the rectangle, was printed um, with some elements of the drawing in it. The text was printed but all the rest of it's hand-coloured. Um, and every version of this that's done is wildly different. I try never to look back at a previous one. Um, I just go for it. Um, and in the same way as making the original drawing, I just did it. The thing about this one, it has the scale. I like the way the seal in the middle of this one is like a face staring out at you. If you read the text, it has some, some relationship. I think I should probably say now, if anyone has something that's either driving them mad or they would like an answer to, it's probably good to interrupt me in the flow. Right, the next thing is my attitude to um, Revelation. First of all, it is, as Chris said earlier on, an extraordinarily clear vision. The next thing is that it is politically somehow aligned with what I feel. Uh, the next thing is that it has some of the elements of my growing up in the 60s with the um, uh, drug fueled visions of, of youngsters. Um, it, uh, it's, again, another moment, you know, like with the stone, it's when something switches on or off. And I like the Jesus if, of the revelations. I like the man who didn't like churches, the man who didn't want religions, the man who cared about people, who wanted to, him to be seen through his actions. And that's, in a, in a way, what you see here. This rather lurid, um, acidic, I'm here, like the handprint in the cave. Now this one, the souls under the altar, um, I like the concept of a cloud of witness. I like the 
pile of people who've been before, who've donated, made us all who we are, who make the world. More challenging, really. It gets harder as we go on. Can you read the script from where you are? No. Oh, done. Yeah, the contrast has gone right down. I'm sorry. They're, they're just working their way through the seven seals. In fact, even on here, I'm finding it hard to read. This is uh, the moment of silence in heaven for about half an hour. Again, it's quite appealing, isn't it? The idea that the whole of creation roars along and then suddenly there's a, a little bit of silence. Compared to Blake that we were looking at before, I feel that these are desperately inadequate. I feel that I can only touch on a small part of this amazing vision. I called this talk on uh, In the Shadow of Dura. I went, I went to Russia and I saw um, a huge pile of Dura with all kinds of variations. And there was a kind of clinical purity, clinical beauty in the woodcuts. And I suppose what I wanted was something which came from inside my being that just touched on this little moment with the opening of the seals. And suddenly, bang, it all happens. Anyway, that's, that's them. And then, uh, not a lot later, but sometime later, um, Chris asked me to um, do some nearer to <coughs> illustrations for the uh, Epworth commentary his Epworth commentary on, on, on Revelation. So here we go. This is my version of death. And it's totally different. Uh, this is uh, across the boundary from pictograms into some form of figuration. and the sea of glass. I, I mean, when in doing the things for Chris, uh, I, I conflated a number of elements together. So uh, the locusts and the snake and the, the glass and, and so on came together. It, I wanted in these to have some of that otherworldly visionary element going on. Mm. In my head here, apart from the all-seeing eyes in the back, was the, the ship of fools, but there's death coming in, and there's... I don't know. I, I carry John, the, whoever John is, quite close to my heart. Um, I like the rambling, shambling nature of the text. I like the um, sudden moments of clarity which then get lost. Okay, I don't know whether you can see this one or not. Uh, there's all sorts going on here. Um, the main thing I would point out is that the figure on the throne with the um, sword coming from his mouth has a sword that's the wrong way round like a sword swallower rather than speaking with sharp brutal clarity it's the opposite this is someone swallowing the the nastiness i'm sorry i think i have to stop there really if, if anyone has anything to ask me please fire away One second, let me just come to you.
that's okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm quite intrigued with this image. Can you please explain the face outside the, outside the arch? Well, you, you'll see in uh, the... Can you see the, the face in the back here? Mm, yes? Not until now. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Right, well, okay. th there's an element of who's inside, who's outside, what the vision is, wh where does it all sit. Um, uh, with these, the, as I said, there's a transition from abstraction to figuration. The nature about the, of the abstraction is that I can play with one visual concept against another. With this, I'm playing with one literary concept against another. That's something that interests me about Blake in his work, in that he transitions from the literary, that is the thing you can describe, into colour and shape and so on, which is very hard to describe, but it completely informs the, the thing that you recognise. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, and I'm intrigued when you say at the beginning that you're trying to pin down... Oh, sorry. Uh, that you're trying to pin down what you're feeling. Mm. You make it sound as if that feeling is kind of static. And it's, I thought that's part of the transformation. It's always evolving and altering and depending on... I don't know. Well, <laughs> I, I, I see, yes. Um, again, I'm repeating things I've said in other conversations this morning. Eric Gill said that pic uh, letters are not letters of things, not pictures of things. Yes, that's a letter. And in the same way, a word has a, a value, not just as a structure, but it has meaning that is attached to the word. And in the same way, um, as I read the text here, I'm trying not to read it as a string of words or po like poetry, the way you're looking for the structure, I'm trying to distill out the idea and then let that sink in and then work with that. And, and I, I know this is rather, it sounds very woolly, but the fact is that visual language is as sharp as any other language. We all know from uh, signs and signifiers, you know, like road signs, that a, a symbol can be as powerful as a word. Okay, anybody else? Right here. Um, uh, um, hi. Uh, I, I like the work very much. And I, I like the way you have attempted to take literary language, poetic language, mm. and transform it into visual language. Mm. But when doing a close reading of anything, uh, generally the reader, not always, but generally the reader brings their own background and, and attitudes. And a close reading, is the attempt to define a close reading as a, a moment in which there's a revelation not only of the author, but of the self, so that the intricacies combine and that there's suddenly a, a new birth of, of some revelation mm. uh, takes place. And my, my question is, have you had an experience outside of the studio where this has taken place? Oh, yeah. Could you tell me about it, us about it? Um, yeah, there have been, there've been several. Um, they, they tend often rooted in the very practical. Um, there's a guy who I walk past every morning uh, who sleeps rough, and we have a deal. I take him a thermos of coffee. He gives me the empty thermos. And that goes on and on and on. And uh, a woman stopped me and said, you mustn't do this. You're not doing him any good. You're not helping him. And I started to explain to her um, why I felt it was good to keep him alive. This is in the winter. And he stepped up and said, you have to understand, I have to help myself. Staying alive is one thing. No one helps me, I have to help myself. And in that statement, I understood two things. One is I take him the coffee to make me feel good, not him. The other thing is that 
actions are not necessarily connected with ideas. Uh, so in the same way, you make, can make a drawing and then suddenly the thing that you've drawn tells you something that you hadn't done. I'm sorry, it's a very long-winded way of explaining it. But, but in, in, the, in, the, in that little exchange, the three of us all suddenly understood something that we hadn't seen before. Time for one more quick question, if there are any. Nope. Kip, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>